You're listening to Aaron Shafawalaf. I live in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm a student at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and I also work with Mormonism Research Ministry based out of Salt Lake City. Today, I am talking with a friend who lives down in Payson, Utah. Jeremy, please introduce yourself to us. Yeah, my name is Jeremy Howard. I am the pastor of Orchard Hills Bible Church in Payson, Utah, about 15 minutes south of Provo. I'm also the co-host of the Do Theology podcast, and it's just a, a pleasure to study and to serve. Tell me about your church and the demographic around you. Our church has been around for 50 years. We just had our 50th birthday last fall. We have some people who are formerly LDS. We have some people who have never been LDS, who aren't even from Utah, who have just ended up in the state. So we've got quite the blend. We've got lots of families. We have lots of singles. It's a great mix. Our area is very heavily LDS. Our valley is about 600,000 people. So from the northern tip of our valley down through just south of Payson. According to the last statistics that were out, I'm sure these numbers have changed since then, but those numbers say we are 84% Mormon in our 600,000 people valley. Uh, That number is going down, uh, down, 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 but the number of atheists and agnostics are going up. Our valley is one half of 1% evangelical Christian. So for context, you are not in direct BYU territory, but it's a short drive. Right, yeah. It's close enough that we sneak up there sometimes and do evangelism anyway. Tell me about that. You have evangelistic encounters with the LDS people. In Utah, it's a very family-oriented environment. So during non-COVID times, every town has festivals, like all spring and summer and fall long. It's just festivals all over the place. You take about um, a 15-mile 20 mile radius of where our church building is located. And we do lots of evangelism at these festivals, whether it's hitting up a bunch of people with tracks at a parade or it's setting up a booth and looking to have long conversations or even something as simple as, you know, I live in a very LDS neighborhood and we get the ward newsletter. So the place where the Mormon goes to church is called a ward building. And they've got a newsletter here, and they drop it off at our house, and it's got a devotional on it from their Mormon scriptures, and it's got phone numbers on there for the leaders of the ward. And so this last go-around, I called up the guy who wrote the devotional and ate a sandwich with him a couple days later talking about his devotional. So there are all kinds of evangelistic opportunities if you just have your eyes open. That's great. I was looking at an article you just published called Four Heresies All Mormons Believe. That's a provocative title. Could you first tell us what is a heresy? A heresy in Christian terms is any doctrine that violates, meaning it disagrees with, a doctrine that is definitional to Christianity. So if we went super duper basic on this, Christianity believes there is only one God. The scriptures make that very plain. That's part of the definition of Christianity, is that there is one God. Therefore, any doctrine, any belief that states there is more than one God is a heresy, because it violates one of the very definitional or fundamental or elementary principles of the faith. When you meet someone who believes in a heresy, this for you is a signal that this person does not have a relationship with the same God that you have. Is that fair to say? Yes, it is, with the exception. I will give a very small asterisk after that. With the exception of a brand new believer who perhaps hasn't been introduced to that doctrine yet. So the Trinity, for example, is a doctrine that many people have heard of. A lot of people mess up. And a Latter-day Saint, for example, is raised thinking the Trinity is the most awful thing in the world. Well, a Latter-day Saint may come to the point of actually believing the biblical gospel without fully grasping the Trinity yet. For a person like that, we need to give grace and give that person room to grow. But if a person has outright rejected one of the elementary principles of the faith, then uh, that person, by definition, is not a Christian. What's the first heresy common to Mormonism that you think separates it from biblical Christianity? The first one is that the Book of Mormon is true. This missionaries, when they come knocking at your door, 
This is what they want you to learn for your, then begin your journey growing. So this is really foundational when it comes to defining what Mormon is. It's a person who believes the Book of Mormon is true. What's the big deal with the Book of Mormon? Why does that separate the Mormon people from the body of Christ? What is it about the Book of Mormon that concerns you? Sure. Yeah. And this can trip a lot of people up because they'll read the Book of Mormon, uh, Christians, that is. Christians will read the Book of Mormon and think, well, you know, it's not too bad. It doesn't say anything that's too shocking. It's new information, but it doesn't seem as though it's antagonistic toward biblical Christianity. In fact, uh, there are lots of people who uh, get tripped up trying to prove that the Book of Mormon is a heretical book. But if we think in basic terms, the fact that it is called Another Testament of Jesus Christ, uh, right there on the cover of the book, that says something right from the get-go. In fact, that says something heretical right from the get-go. We believe as Christians that the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is sufficient. It is full of authority. The Bible is correct all that it teaches or affirms. The Bible is enough. Therefore, no matter what book someone has in his or her hand, if you're being told this is more revelation from God, well, you are already, at that point, working with a heretical teaching before you even open the book, because the Bible is sufficient, and that is a part of what Christianity is defined by, the Bible. The Bible is what gives us all need. We need nothing else. But when you crack open the Book of Mormon, there are heretical things taught in there. The Book of Mormon erases sin nature. It doesn't teach uh, that human beings have a sin nature. In fact, it teaches that children are without sin. They are perfectly innocent, that they are not born into sin, as the Bible teaches. It teaches that it was good that Adam and Eve ate the fruit. In fact, it was necessary for them to do so. It's common for Mormons to say that they fell upwards, and that's because the Book of Mormon says that it was good that they took of the fruit. It teaches that the Bible was going to be corrupted by men. It denies that God would preserve his word. It says that the Bible would have plain and precious truths removed from it by men. So it's priming people to have a less dramatic view of the fall. It's teaching that the Bible will be corrupted or was corrupted. These are pretty terrible teachings. Interestingly, like you've mentioned, it's really not teaching us the things that make modern mainstream Mormonism most interesting. For example, the idea that we can become gods or that God was once a man who became a god or that God is married or that there's a genealogy of the gods. In some respects, the Book of Mormon with exceptions, has a kind of Protestant-ish tone <laughs> or shape to it. If you squint really hard and you try to remove the interpretive lens of modern Mormonism, you can make the Book of Mormon say a lot of evangelical things. The problem is that people aren't trying to merely read it for what it originally meant. They're being taught mm -hmm. how to read it. So that the Book of Mormon functions as a vehicle for modern Mormon doctrines, even if they're not found in there. Yeah, I mean, things that we associate with Mormonism, like baptism for the dead, priesthood, they want to give to you the Aaronic and the Melchizedek priesthood, celestial marriage, the fact that God is an exalted man, all of that we associate with Mormonism, you cannot find in the Book of Mormon is there as a hook to get you to believe and to accept, affirm that Joseph Smith is a prophet. Because one, once you agree to that, everything else then follows. Wouldn't you say that the person of Joseph Smith is even a bigger problem than the Book of Mormon? It seems like the worst thing about the book is the spirit behind it and the hook that it is for a larger worldview system, it's tame in comparison with what followed it. Is that fair to say? Oh, yeah. Again, just the fact that it exists as <laughs> claiming to be another testament of Jesus Christ, that fact alone is enough for us to totally and utterly refuse it on its own terms. 
but in comparison, yeah, it's certainly more tame and more palatable to the Christian who was raised with Bible stories. Yeah, this seems to fit right in if we're just comparing narratives. When I'd have Christian friends move into Utah and they were meeting with the LDS missionaries and trying to acquaint themselves with the Latter-day Saint faith, they would be motivated up front to read the Book of Mormon. And I would often say, (laughs) you might want to skip that for now and just read a book called Gospel Principles, which they use on Sunday mornings to teach their own people. It's their own truncated or concise systematic theology. It's an overview of the big picture or the worldview of the Mormon faith, and it's been used for decades, and it seems to give a better representation of the worldview than the Book of Mormon does. The Book of Mormon, like you said, it kind of throws people off. Uh, It's a hook, but it can be distracting because it's really not teaching what modern Mormonism teaches. So circling back to the the big point here, you take the Book of Mormon to be a point of substantial heresy, though, for what it primes its readers in Mormonism for, namely rejecting the finality of the new covenant, rejecting the finality of the deposit of special revelation, rejecting the severity of the fall, and then calling into question the preservation of the New Testament text. If you read the introduction to the Book of Mormon that Joseph Smith wrote, it says that it's the most correct book on the earth. Quite a claim. And this is what every wayward movement false religion has to do. They have to cast doubt on the Bible, and then they have to lower the status of Jesus. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is no exception to this. You have to on the biblical text, because if we believe, as it says in 2 Peter 1, that God has given us all that we need for life and godliness, if that's true, then we don't need another testament of Jesus Christ. We don't need a restoration of a church 1,800 years after Jesus began building it. So you have to really cast doubt on the Bible and lift up another text in order for a wayward movement under the heading of Christianity to be valid. And as Christians, we can't give on these points. We have to say the Bible is sufficient, God has preserved it, and Jesus is who he said he was, and we are not going to budge on those issues. The second heresy that you list in your article is that evangelicalism is the result of false churches. This is what Mormonism teaches. Uh, Yeah, I just mentioned the restoration. It is important to note the difference between a restoration and a reformation. As Protestant Christians, we are the result of a reformation. Uh, Martin Luther and those men who followed were seeking to reform the uh, Western Church, the Church of the West. They weren't looking for God to restore a church on the face of the earth. If we were to believe that there was a restoration that took place in the Protestant Reformation, what we would be saying is that God's church ceased to exist, that God's church had dissolved. God had no church until the Protestant Reformation. Well, that's not what we believe. We believe that God had his people. He's always had a remnant, and that there was a reformation that needed to occur within the church. The Latter-day Saints believe that through Joseph Smith, the prophet, there was a restoration that took place because there was an apostasy that preceded it, that all Christian denominations had gone astray from the truth. In fact, Joseph Smith said in the first vision account when he saw Jesus and Heavenly Father, so he says, that he was told by them all of the creeds of the existing denominations were an abomination. This means the Westminster Confession, the London Baptist Confession of Faith, even all the way back to the Nicene Creed or the Athanasian Creed. All of those were an abomination and that there was no true church on the face of the earth. Therefore, through Joseph Smith, Latter-day Saints believe God restored a true church on the face of the earth. And if that's the case, that means churches like yours and mine, we are a result of heresy that had existed on the face of the earth. We are a result of falsehood. We are a result of darkness. We are not true churches. Evangelicalism as a whole is made up of false churches 
that is one of the major heresies that every Mormon believes. Why should a Christian feel protective of this idea that the church persisted, that it had a remnant and persevered? The most fundamental point is that Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. If Jesus was just a man, that would be blasphemous for a man to say that. But since Jesus is Lord, because he is God in flesh, he could make such a statement and he can keep such a promise. Jesus said he would build his church and that nothing would stop it. If the gates of hell cannot prevail against his church, he's saying nothing is going to prevail against my church. Jesus made that promise and Jesus has kept that promise. He said that he would be with the church until the end of the age when he gave his great commission at the end of Matthew's gospel. And we have to remember the sovereignty of God in all things. Psalm 115 says that God sits in the heavens and does whatever he pleases. And scripture affirms that he is pleased to save his people. He is pleased to dwell with man and preserve a remnant on the face of the earth to cause people to be born again to a living hope. He's almighty, he's all-powerful, and he does not desire that his people or his word would vanish. Therefore, they don't. I'm reminded of the difference between the Old and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, the people are given a condition for either blessing or curses. And if they fail to uphold their part of the covenant, they will be exiled, they will be in misery, they will be punished severely. But if they keep the covenant, they will be blessed. And built into the very covenant documents of the Old Testament, we have a certain anticipation of the failure of God's people to uphold their part of the covenant. There's this promise uh, at the end of Deuteronomy, and it's also in Ezekiel and and, uh, Jeremiah, that God would give us a new covenant. And in the new covenant, there would be a secure, certain gathering of God's people. God would, he says in Ezekiel 36, uh, give them a new heart, replace their stony, concrete, hard heart with a, a beating heart of alive flesh, that God would cause them to keep the commandments, that he would put the fear of God in them so that they would not turn away from him. The language is pretty stark. It's amazing. So we have Jesus now who, according to the book of Hebrews, is the mediator of the new covenant. And like you said, he promised that even if heaven and earth passed away, his word would not pass away, that he would be with his people to the end of the age. He would mediate this new covenant. So in order for Jesus to fail to keep his church alive, to keep his kingdom intact, he would have to fail as the mediator of the new covenant. His promises would ultimately be false. He would not be true to his word. He would not be a worthy savior. Something that I I think gets lost in a lot of Christian theology is the present ministry of Christ Christ as priest. We understand his past ministry as priest, particularly when he interceded for us on the cross, um, how Jesus was the final sacrifice in paying for our sin on the cross, and how that fulfilled all of the old covenant sacrifices. We no longer have to slaughter goats or bulls. And we think of the future ministry of Christ, particularly his ministry as king, where he will be ruling and reigning on the face of the earth. And in the consummation of all things, he will be the perfect king on the face of the earth. Yet we can often miss the present ministry of Christ as priest. It says in Hebrews 7.25 that Jesus always lives to make intercession for his people. The reason Jesus is carrying on in the present is to make intercession for his people. You take away his people, what's he doing? This gets lost on a lot of Christians, but of course it gets lost on a lot of Latter-day Saints because they believe for a long period of time Jesus wasn't interceding for anybody. Therefore, his present ministry was nil. So to fill that out, in the traditional Latter-day Saint view, the kingdom of God was destroyed. The new covenant people were absent. The church no longer existed, and we're just waiting around for Joseph Smith. 
to reinstate God's covenant people, his church, his kingdom people. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. I, I think one of the most breathtaking parts of Mormonism I've ever encountered is Joseph Smith's boast to have done uh, essentially a better job than Jesus himself at keeping the church together. He, mm. he boasted that the, the disciples had run away from Jesus, but the Latter-day Saints had not run away from him, Joseph Smith. He had done such a work as to keep the church together. And the glory of Christ, biblically, is that he keeps the church together. He keeps the, the sheep from being scattered in a final and definitive and apostatizing kind of mm -hmm. way. So the third heresy is that, you write, we are all going to heaven. What is the Latter-day Saint view of the afterlife? It's bend toward universalism. And how does this contrast with the biblical view of heaven and hell? In the Christian view, we've got two eternal realities for the soul, either eternal bliss by being in the presence of God and bringing honor and glory and praise to his name forever and ever, or eternal torment and anguish by being cast into the lake of fire. These uh, are the realities that the Bible presents to us. Well, Mormonism really takes that whole uh, page out of our theology, crumples it up, and gives us something brand new. And, and this isn't really something you would expect from a wayward movement, especially one that claims to be the only true church on the face of the earth, you would think. Punishment, if you reject this one true church, right? Not really. There is no payment for that rejection. There is no penalty for sin, because they believe in Jesus Christ's atonement, and again, they believe in a, a different Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus being the one true God of the universe, but rather he is the first creation, our elder brother. Um, they look at the atonement of Jesus and say, he not only died for everybody, but he effectively paid for all of their sin. Therefore, no one is going to any type of hell. Instead, People are going to end up in one of three heavenly kingdoms. The bottom kingdom is the telestial, the middle kingdom is the terrestrial, and the top kingdom is the celestial. And to give you a real nutshell version that doesn't do justice to the whole thing, but to give you an idea, the celestial kingdom at the top is for faithful Latter-day Saints, and that's where they can become their own gods and enjoy eternal marriage. The middle kingdom is where guys like me and Aaron go. This is where the Christians go and those who tried to be good people in their theology. The bottom kingdom, the telestial kingdom, is for all the worst people in the world, murderers and rapists and those who hate God, who wanted nothing to do with God's commands. They get to go to the telestial kingdom. And Joseph Smith said that this bottom kingdom has an indescribable glory. It's a true heavenly kingdom. So Latter-day Saints will often say, God gives you what you want. If you want a lesser glory, then God will give that to you. But if you want to work through the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by performing their ordinances, if, if you want to work for exaltation, God will give you that too. So it's whatever you would like. You get to go to heaven, pick which kingdom you want. You can work for it, or you don't work at all and just camp out in the bottom kingdom where you can hang out with the Holy Ghost. That'll be fine with God if that's fine with you. That's essentially their view on that. Now, the one caveat on this is that they do believe in a place called outer darkness, but Today, especially, you are hard-pressed to find any Latter-day Saint who will tell you who's going there. They do not want to talk about that. Judas, they, maybe? Th they, uh, yeah, that's right. Judas, yeah. You know, Hitler. Yeah, may maybe they'll agree that Hitler went to outer darkness, maybe. Traditionally, the view essentially was if you were in the Mormon church and then you left, that means you lost your testimony and you're headed for outer darkness. You're a son of perdition. You're headed for outer darkness. But today, they are really soft on that language, and they don't want to condemn anybody, not even a hypothetical person. They don't want to condemn anybody to that place, and they just essentially believe everyone's going to heaven. This sounds like the spirit of universalism, where people are squeamish and uncomfortable with the idea that God would actively send anybody 
to go to hell, aside from maybe Hitler <laughs> and Judas. But, but it, when we think about yeah. typical or normal human depravity, there's no sense, it seems, that's common to the Mormon people that the common person, the common functioning adult deserves eternal conscious torment for a lifetime of sins and corruption. That It's coupled with this sentiment that God is going to send people to a very comfortable heavenly kingdom of some sort. They do believe in some sort of intermediate state, a spirit prison or a temporary hell, but it ends up going to an eternal state of glory, a degree of glory. And to complicate it, I've had trouble getting a consistent message about the terrestrial and celestial kingdoms. I've seen quotes from Latter-day Saint leaders that describe it in language of glory. Uh, very common folklore among the Mormon people is that if you had a glimpse of how beautiful and glorious the bottom celestial kingdom was, you would want to commit suicide just to get there. And yet I've also mm-hmm. seen right. quotes from uh, some Latter-day Saint leaders like Joseph Fielding Smith, who in trying to motivate people to avoid going to a bottom heavenly kingdom, <laughs> describe it as a kind of eternal torment and eternal punishment because you'll live with a permanent regret that you did not achieve a higher glory, a higher kingdom, and that you permanently are uh, distant uh, from or detached from or not dwelling with the, the faithful members of your family that ended up in a higher kingdom. The uh, former pastor of our church would say that the celestial kingdom, it's like a really nice mansion, except the shower handles break off in your hand sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's essentially how they view it, is that's a beautiful place, but, you know, it's kind of annoying to be there. And I've had several Latter-day Saints describe to me their version of hell would be being in one of the lower kingdoms, regretting not being in the upper kingdom. And there are a couple things to note from that. One is, that is not how the Bible talks about hell. Jesus talked about uh, an eternal place of torment on a variety of occasions, and that is not how he described it. But secondly, the regret that a person has, has is purely selfish. This isn't about the glory of God anymore. This is about the glory of man. And it's a prideful thing that they would regret not being in the upper kingdoms where they would be enjoying things more for themselves or potentially becoming gods themselves and having their own planet. That is a very selfish, prideful, conceited version of hell. It's very odd to me that any religion that would consider itself Christian would even attempt to paint a positive picture of living in a heavenly kingdom permanently without Christ in your presence or dwelling among Mm you. Uh, To to paint a picture of people smiling and happy and joyous, and Jesus isn't there. It really speaks to what that religion sees as essential for joy. It's not Christ. Mm -hmm. So what does the New Testament teach about this? What's the data? What, What do we have before us? What does Scripture teach about the dichotomy between heaven and hell. You, you've brushed up on this a bit, but what, what else does it say? One of the first verses I memorized, and I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I became a believer at age 16, really started believe, or reading my Bible at age 17, and I was reading through the book of Matthew. And one of the first verses I memorized was Matthew 10, 28, where Jesus says, Don't fear man, rather fear God, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. (laughs) I remember reading that thinking, whoa, that's quite a statement from Jesus. He says a lot of shocking things in Matthew 10, by the way. But there's a very foundational idea is that it's a place of destruction of both body and soul. The most detailed passage that Jesus gives us on this is in Luke 16, where he talks about this rich man being in Hades. And the rich man is in a flame of fire, it says, He is in anguish. He is feeling some sort of pain. He's asking for a drop of water to be placed on his tongue because he's just dried up and he's in anguish in the flame. And uh, there's a great chasm fixed between that place and 
at that time, what was called Abraham's bosom. That's where this man named Lazarus went. When you start putting together these teachings that Jesus has, a place of destruction, a place of flame, a place of torment, and then you add in the other New Testament texts, particularly the end of Revelation, where it talks about the final state of those who do not accept the gospel, don't bend the knee to Jesus, don't put their trust, their faith in Jesus Christ, the final state for them is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire, as are all people whose names are not written in the book of life. That is a eternal place. It says that people are tormented forever and ever in that place. So hell is real. Hell is for those who are not in Christ, those who do not have Jesus as their Lord, who refuse to submit to the truth. That is hell. Heaven, on the other hand, is the very presence of God. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, it says at the end of the book. Spoiler alert for those who haven't read that far. A new heaven and a new earth. God is making all things new. We won't have need for the the moon, (laughs) but we will have light there. We will have eternal joy in Christ. It's not eternal joy on our own apart from Christ, but we will be with him and we will see fulfillment in all things and we will see purpose in all things. We will have great satisfaction in all things and it will be a God-glorifying bliss that we will enjoy forever and ever. Those are the two eternal resting places, the new heaven and new earth and the lake of fire. And where a soul goes totally, utterly, completely depends on what that person does with Jesus. Does that person submit to him as Lord and Master, or does that person utterly reject him? Those are the only two options. Mention says that personal revelation and feeling override all else. Explain what the Latter-day Saint position or common practices with respect to this, and please contrast it with the biblical mode of seeking after truth. Going back to the first heresy, which is the Book of Mormon is true, and the idea of the missionaries at your door wanting you to understand that the Book of Mormon is true, what they will do eventually is ask you not only to read the Book of Mormon, but then to ask God, if it is right, and ask God to give you a testimony, to affirm to you in a supernatural way that the Book of Mormon is true. In fact, it says in the Doctrine and Covenants, which is another Mormon scripture, you must study the Book of Mormon out in your mind. Then you must ask me, God speaking, if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. So right from the get-go, there's this promise that you'll hear from Latter-day Saints that God will give you some sort of a tingle, and that's him saying, yep, this is right. The whole Mormon movement started with Joseph Smith reading, so he says, James 1, 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and God will give you wisdom. God doesn't hold back his wisdom. He will give you wisdom. That's the promise of Scripture. Well, Joseph Smith says he took this idea. He applied it to his religious decision-making. He asked God to give him wisdom about which church to join. And that's, of course, when he found out that none of the churches were true and that it was all going to be restored through him. So he said, today they will give you that verse and say, God says, ask him for things and he will give it to you. Ask him for a feeling about the Book of Mormon and he will give you that feeling. That is not what James 1.5 is teaching. That is not the way we are designed or created to go about discerning truth. There is no sensation that you could ever feel, no emotion that you could ever feel that would be proof of divine affirmation of your life. People have all sorts of feelings. People in every religion or outside of religion have feelings about what is right or what is true. And the Bible teaches us in Jeremiah 17, 9, that our hearts are deceitful. The things that we feel, the things that we think, 
are deceitful at their root. And we shouldn't trust ourselves, but we should appeal to God. We should appeal to the objective Word of God to know who He is and who we are. It's our responsibility to pay attention to Scripture and to submit to it, because Scripture is the Word of God. Any feelings that we might have, any divine sensation that we think we're feeling, it has to be put in submission to the Bible. If we are putting our own revelation or our own sensations over and above the Bible's testimony, we are by definition acting in heresy, saying that we have more authority than the Word of God. That's a very dangerous position to be in. Restate for me, what is the Christian mode of pursuing truth? How ought a person seek after a certain knowledge of the truth? What should they look to? What does that look like for Christians? What's the alternative to closing a book and praying for a special emotional epiphany? Uh, Speaking in theological terms, God reveals himself in two main categories. The first way is called general revelation. That's when you walk outside and you look at the stars out there. You look at the sky and see the amazing universe before you, and you say, wow, God. That's what Scripture says, the heavens declare the glory of God. That's what's going on there, and that's called general revelation. And all people have been given general revelation. God has made his existence evident to all men. They are without excuse, Romans 1 says, because God has revealed to all people that he exists, general revelation. And then there's a category called special revelation. This is where the Bible fits in. The Bible gives us way more information than the stars in the night sky give us. The stars in the night sky can tell us that God exists, but not much more than that. The Word of God, however, goes into great detail about this God who created all things and about who we are as his creatures. So we appeal to the Word of God to learn all that we need to know. We understand that God has spoken. And we start and end with the Word of God when it comes to developing our beliefs and our convictions. So we use Scripture, and we use the counsel of God's people. What's amazing, once you understand the gospel and believe, you're brought into this family. And all the people in this family have been given gifts. They come together to encourage one another and to counsel one another. So you have the Word of God. And you also have God's people when you become a Christian. And through those two mechanisms, God guides and directs your life in in the most intimate and special ways because you've been united with him through the gospel. It's a mystical union that you've been brought near by the blood of Christ and you're one spirit with Christ, Scripture teaches. Uh, The Holy Spirit lives within you, God himself has made your body his temple. And as Christians come together to study the Word of God and to counsel one another, we can know that we are being led by the God who's made all of us. Jeremy, where can someone learn more about what you believe about Christianity and how you respond to the Latter-day Saint faith? Sure. You can go um, to a variety of places. I'll just list three places one by one. So you can go to my website, jeremyhoward.net. And at that website, there's a little bar there. Search this site. You can type in whatever term you want to look up, and I've probably written about it. You can also go to dotheology.com, and in the archives, you can see some conversations I've had with people. You can see some debates I've had in there, and you can check out more of my theological positions in audio form there. And then finally, I preach most Sundays. I teach quite a bit, too, and so do the other elders, the other pastors in our church. Uh, You can go to orchardhillsbiblechurch.com, get connected with our audio there if you just are are looking for Bible teaching, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We've got it right there. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for your time. I hope people see a preview of how broad the differences are between Mormonism and and biblical Christianity. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure to talk through these things with you, and I hope it's helpful.